we are doing this uh, strangely casual thing, um, and yet also you're all there at the planetarium, which I'm thinking is must be something else to be sitting there. And then thank you to everybody who are at home or wherever you are, and uh, we're all sharing this Zoom land together. Um, so I'm very pleased to have my work being shown right now with Elise Simon in uh, Experimental Light. Um, you know, her sculptures, for those of you who have maybe not seen them, uh, she created her sculptures using, get this, an atomic particle accelerator um, in order to focus it on altering um, acrylic glass. So she has some really uh, beautiful work. Um, so today, uh, let's go to my next slide here. Um, I would like to say that the museum, if you haven't seen the show, you can see it virtually um, at this uh, URL that you see in the slide here. Um, I have a couple of experimental videos in the exhibition, but what you're seeing on the side are uh, Alice Simon's work. Um, so do check it out. So today I'm going to talk about how I developed as an artist, uh, what motivates me, uh, or as curator Lexi says, uh, take a deep dive uh, into process and the science um, connection. And it all starts here. <laughs> um, Horton Hears a Who by Dr. Seuss. Uh, when I was a child, I read a book, this book, I was sitting in my living room, sofa, and uh, maybe I was eight or maybe nine or 10. Um, and I read this book and it just totally blew me away. Um, for those of you who might not know the story, it's about Horton, the elephant, who, you know, I think he's bathing in the jungle and he suddenly hears a little sound, a little whoo, you know, coming from what he realizes is like a, a speck, a particle floating in the air. And he learns that there is actually a whole world of creatures living on this little particle. Um, and, you know, the rest of the story goes on from there. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, the other jungle animals don't hear it and they don't believe him that there is a world in Whoville on this um, speck of particle. So, you know, I, read it, I finished reading this book as a kid and I remember sitting there completely stunned because I thought to myself, what if I was one of those jungle animals who could not hear the who? Then I wouldn't know that there was this reality that existed that Horton knew about and Horton could communicate with the people in Whoville, but I would not be able to. Um, and so it was amazing. I, I remember sitting there and looking at the, you know, the fabric on my sofa and thinking, what if there's something right there and I don't even know it. <laughs> and so it just opened up the world to me. It, expanded my imagination and I learned from this Dr. Seuss story that, you know, we may not perceive everything, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So flash forward as an adult and as an artist, I am inspired by the thought that reality may not be what it seems. It's how we think of it depends. It depends on our perceptions, you know. Uh, what if we had mi microscopes for eyes? I mean, certainly we would experience the world quite differently. So this major questions of what is the nature of reality and what is the nature of mind has really stuck with me. And I seem to keep coming back to it in different ways as an artist. Um, so yes, uh, earlier um, Lexi mentioned that I am interested in things that lie at the threshold of perception. So this is why. I, I blame it on Dr. Seuss. <laughs> um, and so as I developed as an artist, um, I realized that I'm also amazed by science and what science can show us about the objective world. Um, so this is a work that is currently being shown uh, in, in the museum. It is a work dated back to 2007, and I will play you an excerpt of it. It's, uh, the full thing is, as you can see, eight minutes uh, long. 
Um, but, you know, so one of the things that I'm interested in are, you know, well, what, what can't we see? Particles, I mean, we all know from science that, you know, there are things called molecules and atoms and so forth. Um, so this is a video and let me get it started and then I'll just talk while we're playing it. It is silent, so you won't hear anything. Um, this is one of my early works. Um, I am trained as a painter, um, but lo and behold, you know, digital technology uh, made it possible for somebody trained as a painter to later on um, start making moving images without actually going through a film video department, which you used to have to do. Um, so what you're seeing here is my imagining a secret world and worlds within worlds. Um, and I'm imagining what do things look like on a micro scale and what do they look like on a macro scale? Um, so this was originally created as a site specific art installation. Um, it was projected onto a mirror frame. Um, the idea was to create this kind of through the looking glass experience of alternate reality. Um, and it was originally shown uh, in Wave Hill Gallery uh, in the Bronx, New York. Um, and the curator, Elizabeth uh, Weinstein, had originally here at the Louisiana Art and Science Museum some years ago, had shown this uh, there, and it was how it originally became part of um, the collection at the museum. So the description for this is between a curtain of snow, an imaginary microscopic world emerges, and then things transform into other entities. Um, so in the beginning, I'm thinking microscopic shapes, but then the camera pulls back and then all of a sudden, it looks like a larger thing that then becomes a smaller thing. And also uh, it's worth mentioning that this show was, um, the original show at Wave Hill was a winter show. So the artists were asked to create themes that were winter related. So the other work that is on view right now at the museum is a piece called Jewel. Um, and Jewel here is hanging right here. It's a, uh, a, a originally created for an exhibition called Global where um, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum uh, curator Richard Klein had given 20 artists a globe. And he just said, alter it, do something with it. And he called the show Global. Um, so in this work, I decided to project northern and southern hemispheres and then see what happens. So I'm going to play you an excerpt here. And this is actually from, this is video from the installation originally, but. So again, it's a two channel digital video installation and it's also silent. The original thing is about two minutes long. I'll probably skip through this, but what you see uh, is rotating continents. I mean, you know, what you recognize about a globe, you know, with the, the names of the nations and measurements and longitudes and latitudes. And what happens is eventually everything starts shifting in colors um, and then transforming its shapes into abstract land masses. Um, and then eventually it will dissolve. So I'm going to fast forward it a bit so you can see how it begins morphing and then changing more into fractal patterns. So the piece began with my idea of thinking that we all have these conscious lives, you know, living on earth and that earth is kind of a, a jewel of constructed reality because we all just have certain ways of seeing and hearing and, and feeling our ways in the world. Um, but it certainly would be different if we had different kinds of perceptual skills. So um, getting back to the idea about, you know, me being amazed by science and what it shows us about our objective world. At about the time that I was making those two works that you just saw, um, I learned about Dr. Richard Davidson. He's a neuroscientist at the University of Wisconsin. And I learned about his groundbreaking work, which greatly did influence me. Um, he, he works in, uh, investigating the neural basis of emotions. 
Um, he's looked into neuroplasticity, which is the capacity of our brains to develop and change throughout life. Um, I don't know how long ago, but it wasn't that long ago, call it maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, scientists actually thought that, you know, when you become an adult, your brains just stay the way they are, um, that the nerves don't really change very much and so on. But we have found that that's not the case. So, um, and what you're looking at here is a, a group of photos in which um, the, some of the studies that he has done that amazed me is where he used EEG and functional MRI to track and image the brains of highly experienced Buddhist monks. And by highly experienced, they have more than 10,000 hours of practice in meditation. Um, and meditation, there are many, many different kinds of meditation, but um, I'm particularly inter interested in the ones where they do what's called a single point focus, um, where they have a concentration and they relax and they, they really just ease their minds and just have a single quiet focus without distraction. And what uh, Dr. Davidson found when he imaged their brains and they were doing uh, this kind of meditation was that they showed brain functions that are vastly unlike most of us. Um, and it's, it has to do with the prefrontal cortex, which is considered the you know, human's most evolved part of our brains and which is related to emotion regulation. Um, and for these long-term highly skilled meditators, that area of their brain is far more activated um, than most of us to the degree that when they were tested in, in total silence and suddenly a loud noise was introduced, they just didn't have that startle response as most of us would. And it actually stunned the researchers because they did not think that that was possible to get past that kind of the body's autonomic um, uh, you know, functions. Um, so Dr. Davidson said, quote, they do hear the sound because we can detect that in the auditory cortex, but they don't have the emotional reaction, um, unquote. So through uh, Dr. Davidson, I also learned about the work of Dr. James Cohen of the University of Virginia. He is known for his hand-holding studies and what has led to uh, his social baseline theory. Now, this is a very interesting um, study here. He took 16 couples uh, in, their, in his initial um, uh, uh, experiment, 16 couples in which the female spouse was the subject whose brain was scanned in the fMRI uh, study. And the, the person, the wives, the females were told that they would see a symbol light up. And when they did, they might or they might not receive a mild electric shock to their foot. Um, and so that was the stress factor in this. And they were, uh, their brains were um, scanned and, and uh, imaged under three different conditions. Under holding the spouse's hands, um, under holding the hand of a stranger uh, who was the lab technician, or holding no one's hand at all. And the results were, again, also quite stunning and amazing. Uh, the results showed that by far, holding hands reduced the stress responses of the hypothalamus. Uh, which is the part of the brain that uh, regulates stress hormones that, um, that there also greatly affects one's immune system. Uh, holding the hand of the spouse was the one that reduced the most stress response versus the hand of the stranger, but even holding the hand of a stranger made a huge difference. And holding no one's hand was significantly higher in stress response. Um, and he has now done many more of these studies, um, and you know, uh, we, it's generally understood now in the scientific community that we now know that humans are adapted to each other, um, that the human brain and body uh, have developed to be fundamentally social, relational, and hardwired for empathy. I love that. We're hardwired for empathy. So here's what uh, Dr. Cohen says, quote, when our social support system inhibits our hypothalamus's response to stress, we release fewer potentially destructive stress hormones 
and we have a stronger immune system. With familiarity, other people become a part of ourselves and our self comes to include the people we feel close to." Unquote. So I have been incredibly um, really motivated and impressed and inspired by both Dr. Davidson and Dr. Cohen for their work. Um, but it has been Dr. Cohen who led to this work that I did not that long ago um, through Artahack. Artahack is a, an artist uh, kind of a fellowship uh, workshop that held, is held annually in New York City. Um, and it is held by ThoughtWorks, uh, which is an international software development company. Um, and we, uh, what they do is they actually invite artists to submit proposals and then they choose artist driven projects and they put together a team to help collaborate and then to help realize that project. Um, of course, the other team members are also people who are submitting proposals. So they're kind of culling um, people who are interested in the program in the first place and then putting them together. Uh, so I was put together with a team, but there were five of us. So we had um, uh, Gabe, who was a programmer, um, and we had a couple of artists who understood how to use programming language. And then we had uh, one person who was an, an industrial designer. So what is it? Uh, Dual Brains is a three minute long performance uh, using real time EEG. It's a brain data driven performance. So um, we are wearing gear that Aaron Trocola, who is the, uh, the industrial designer, he designed it. Um, and I will move on and show you as I speak. The video which Which we filmed um, a bit later on. So dual brains was first inspired again by the neuroscientific research that indicates that human brains are fundamentally hardwired um, for empathy, and especially under conditions of stress. Uh, so the performer's EEG data is visually presented while they focus their minds on something emotionally charged, so something a little upsetting and stressful. Um, and first they do it without physical contact, and then they do it by holding hands. And so the performers, uh, as you can see, it's me <laughs> and Aaron, who is the one who designed the headgear. Um, so the project aims to create dialogue ultimately. Um, and the first minute we're just relaxing because the equipment that we use is actually scientific level equipment. It's quite sensitive. It takes in raw data. So there is a lot of information that it's taking in and you really need to just sort of quiet down um, to have the noise, you know, what they call data noise, uh, uh, slow down a bit. And then the second minute we start um, imagining the uh, the stressful you know memory, um, and then in the third minute we then continue the memory, and then we begin holding hands. So hopefully you can hear the sound. Um, the sound is actually coming from an ECG data, which is not live. That was pre-recorded but the EEG is live. So what you're seeing there, those colors, the waves, they are coming from the brain data. Um, if you are able to hear the, the heart, uh, the cardio sounds, um, we did find it a lovely thing that we started off not in sync, but later on actually the cardio uh, becomes in sync with each other. Um, so pretty soon we're going to move into the third minute. So I would like to say for those of you who might be interested, 
Um, the project uses OpenBCI, which stands for Open Source Brain Computer Interface. Um, it is something that is available. Uh, anybody can play with it. Uh, you can go and visit their website. And I would like to say thanks to the maker movement and STEAM efforts uh, that, that something like OpenBCI exists. So we are using their technology, even though um, Aaron Trucola here has um, made, he's actually created the design that we're wearing, but um, the nodes and the, uh, the user interface and so forth, that is OpenBCI. And if you have any makers out there, these are Arduino compatible. Um, and uh, the, the programming, the programmer who was Gabe Ivagon, he took in the raw data and he programmed it so that it would be what's called reduced, usable. And then that reduced data was then used by uh, our two artists, Pat Shu and Gail Nisim. Um, they use processing language to then convert it into the visuals. Um, so, you know, I think that it's, it's wonderful in a time where we have a lot of new technology happening that um, there are new tools that artists can actually use. Um, and, and I think that, you know, part of the show that is happening at the museum right now is that, you know, Alice Simon, I mean, she was using a, a, an atomic particle accelerator. I mean, how, I just think that's quite an amazing thing that she was able to do that. And here we are also living in a time where we have open VCI. So a team of artists can be put together with different skills and make something like this happen. So the initial um, presentation and performance of this was we only had four uh, weeks, uh, four weekends to get together and do this. So we didn't know if it would work, but when we did perform it, uh, you're seeing a photo here, it was at the Artahack uh, uh, performance. So there were many other teams. So other teams who completed their projects, they also presented their works at the Artahack performance. And then the second time we performed it was in 2018 at the Spring Break Art Show in New York City. That's quite a, um, a large uh, uh, show that happens annually. Um, and you can kind of see here that Aaron continued working and designing uh, the headpiece there. And then that same year, we also performed it at XCOMF, uh, which is put on by ThoughtWorks. It's, uh, and this was also in uh, 2018, but I said that already. So it, it, is, um, it is a tech conference that's created by technologists for technologists uh, who care deeply about the craft of software and its ability to make the world a better place which I think is really a wonderful mission because we are in a time where such amazing changes are happening. And, you know, uh, to use software, to be able to design in a way to make the world a better place is a huge topic. So these days I find myself interested in mind and reality uh, in terms of the future of AI. Um, so here I am, I am back to the same questions that I have been driven by, which is what is the nature of mind? And of course, what is the nature of reality? So, you know, I think often about 10 years ago or so, you know, we all didn't walk around with these things, which are you know, our iPhones, which are really like, they're just powerful mini computers. And it, with, with global access, you know, and global communications, and we walk around with these things in our pockets. I mean, when I think about these these days, I mean, it, 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 amazes, it amazes me. Because sometimes when I misplace my phone, I, I, I get panicky. <laughs> Because, you know, it's this feeling, and I, I know you guys out there must relate, it's this feeling somehow like I've misplaced a part of myself, you know, because I keep so much stuff on it and, and so much communication. So, you know, um, it's really us interacting with a huge network and, 
you know, AI is already affecting us, but most of the time, I think most of us don't really think about it, you know, um, but you know, it's there when you're watching Netflix and then Netflix says, oh, you saw this movie, you might like these movies. Amazon, Facebook, Google, you know, they all have ads tailored to your preferences and how you use uh, the internet. And so I've started reading and I've started like diving into what does this mean? And you know, the thing is that, that stuns me is that AI is really bringing on an unprecedented new paradigm. I mean, the global changes that are coming from this, I know a lot of academics are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. Some are calling it the intelligence revolution. But you know, unlike other industrial revolutions in which, yes, you know, I mean, Thomas Alva Edison came up with harnessing the power of electricity and then it took, you know, all these talented engineers to create machinery. But you know, we were always, we were always in control of the tools and of the machinery. And what is changing now is AI and self-learning machinery where they can even create their own algorithms. And, you know, I'm not a computer scientist, so I can't speak as well uh, as I'm sure those who are working in the field can. But as a lay person, I can imagine how AI and self-learning machines, when you think about Google's DeepMind and Neuralink and all the research and development that's being done, um, you know, robotics, everyone has been talking about self-driving vehicles. Those are essentially robots that we would all be stepping into. Um, those will be the things that we see. But now, Right now, we are already greatly changing and the world has greatly been changed in the last, you know, call it 10, 15 years, where all of us lay people are using these tools um, and things are changing exponentially versus hundreds of years in which it took, you know, industrial revolutions to, to slowly then change and become a part of the new normal in life. Um, so, you know, these days there are um, academics, thinkers, philosophers, physicists who are talking about surveillance capitalism, the attention economy, uh, the quantified self, um, the colonization of consciousness. And what I really want to say is maybe we all need to be thinking about this more. We all need to be learning and talking about it. Um, so that it's not only, you know, corporate, state, or military agencies that are thinking about these things. Um, and then, you know, there's also, what about, you know, identities? You know, what about illusory selves? You know, I mean, many of us have created avatars and we are playing games or, um, you know, we're developing these other virtual selves. I mean, what happens when we're living more in augmented reality? or virtual reality in which you can actually just totally be uh, another self. What is that going to come to? What does that mean? So I think, you know, I think of this these days as we have, to put it very simply, we have techno idealists, you know, people who like Ray Kurzweil, who believe that there's this term, you know, called singularity, which I only really learned recently. It just means that AI will become so super intelligent and so surpassing human ability that they will reach this point, infinite point where they are just far more evolved as us. You know, so from a techno idealist point of view, you know, humans maybe will evolve as AI. Um, we're going to transcend our biology. We won't be just stuck in these bodies. Uh, we'll actually be perceiving differently. And maybe we'll even reach immortality. There might be such a thing as we can download our personalities um, and live in the vast, you know, internet or the vast uh, AI world. Now, opposed to that, we have techno realists or people that I think of as techno realists who say, well, wait a minute, folks. Maybe that's not going to happen. It's not just going to be a total, you know, digital world. We're still human and we're still going to be around, but maybe we'll be more like cyborgs. You know, some of us may have chips implanted to, to uh, we will remain embodied, uh, but maybe we'll be, uh, you know, heightened uh, with our uh, perceptual skills. Or maybe some of us who, you know, become a little bit 
ill with some kind of ailment, you know, can be more cured and so forth. Um, so, you know, so whether you fall on the techno idealist side or the techno realist side, um, I do think that we all need to think about like, where are we headed? And what are the ethics involved in this? How much is it going to change the way we live with each other, the way we think about each other, the way that we make decisions and conduct our lives? Um, so I'd like to leave you with this thought that we really do need to have dialogue. We need to have discussions with each other, all of us. I mean, whether we're in the humanities or the sciences or we're teachers and, and, and so forth, uh, or in the medical industry. Um, because I think we, we need to have some deep consideration. Um, and, and again, not only on the corporate and state and military levels, um, but because we are all engaged and we are slowly part and parcel of the forming of this next revolution. Um, and so how we, you know, use these digital devices and there's going to be many other ones uh, invented and introduced to become the new normal. Um, so we can ask ourselves things like, what do we support and what do we not want to support and so forth? And, and how are our sense of selves and our interaction with the world? How are we oriented in the world? Um, how, how is that today? And how might that become? And where do we want to be with that? So there is the, philosoph the philosopher Nick Bostrom, um, who said, quote, the challenge presented by the prospect of super intelligence and how we might best respond is quite possibly the most important and the most daunting uh, challenge humanity has ever faced." Unquote. And actually, um, I would like to also read you another quote. And this is by the theoretical physicist and cosmologist Stephen Hawking. Quote, the development of full artificial intelligence could, spend, could spell the end of the human race. It would take off on its own and redesign itself in an ever increasing rate. Humans who are limited uh, by slow biology evolution could, could not complete, compete and would be superseded, unquote. So those are really some, you know, great thinkers who are sharing with us their, some of their concerns. Um, and again, you know, one might be idealistic, one may be more of a realist, but let's ask ourselves, where do we want to position ourselves? And this, for me, is where I come back to the work that Dr. Richard Davidson and Dr. James Cohen um, uh, have presented to us, which I feel um, in the new paradigm are important for us to keep in mind. Um, that, you know, in such a, a new revolution, do we want to remain in control of our tools? Do we think of it that way? Um, or are we thinking of self-learning AI as well? They're part of us as well. So we're okay with that. But when it comes to mind and consciousness, um, I, I really believe that there is a lot of positive change that we can build from what neuroscience has already demonstrated for us. I mean, we are here now, we are embodied, and there is the possibility through neuroplasticity, we know it exists, we know that we can change our own habitual behaviors. We know that we can practice and through the mental training that um, different uh, meditation practices can help us with, we can in fact train our minds to be more aware. We can be more aware of who we are and what, what um, contexts we are currently in, what contexts we want to be in. Um, and I would like to say that in terms of meditation, the Buddhist practices of meditations, we have a lot to learn from that. It's been over 2,500 years of um, practice being shared from person to person, from teacher to student. And, and as 
Dr. Richard Davidson has shown, it really does demonstrate a certain kind of mind over body. That's the kind of power there is in that. Um, and so there is this concept of who we are present as. I mean, we have all kinds of, even without you know a lot of um, fancy sci-fi things to think about, we have different consciousnesses throughout the day. I mean, sometimes we're deeply focused on something, for example. Sometimes we're asleep and dreaming. It's the same mind, it's us. <laughs> um, and so I think that with meditation practice, I mean, one can become better at knowing who we are present as, how we are thinking, making decisions moment to moment, and how we can change aspects of behavior that we may find damaging moving forward, how we may choose to act ethically. And then I would like to also say that Dr. James Cohen's work I find incredibly, um, uh, you know, uh, something to, for us to hold in our hearts that we are in fact relational people. Um, you know, I mean, we know that you know, we know that intuitively, that if you hold someone's hand, you're going to feel better. If, you know, when I was a child and I had to go to the dentist and I was afraid of, you know, the dentist doing drilling in my mouth, you know, an adult would be holding my hand, my mom, my aunt, my grandma, and it would make me feel much better. So, um, but science has actually shown us uh, in a quantitative way, in, in an empirical way, uh, that we do have mutually empathic ways that humans help each other. So I'm wondering, what does this mean as we move into AI and in the intelligence revolution? Can we learn from 2,500 years of mental training and meditation and put it together with our bodily biological evolution of being mutually um, empathic with each other? What can we learn and how can we actually put this towards the future? Um, and maybe that is a question, of course, for people who are coders and researchers and working in Silicon Valley. Um, but it does involve all of us because all of us are part and parcel of it. So I would like to you know, say that this would hopefully get you thinking and perhaps um, diving yourselves, you know, into uh, learning more about the work that is being done on, on, at the frontier uh, of, of science and how it is beginning to take shape in, in our lives together uh, globally. So I would like to end by saying, um, Thank you so much for your time. And um, before I turn it back over to uh, Lexi for a Q&A uh, session, um, uh, if you are interested in learning a little more about my work, you can go visit my website. I do have writings and musings on my blog. Um, if you're a scientist uh, or somebody who's coding or you're interested in discussing ideas further with me, I would love very much to explore, you know, any STEAM collaborations, uh, please do reach out to me. Uh, you can find my contact information on my website. Uh, Dual Brains is also, a, a can be developed further. Um, there it, and again, as I said before, it is coded in Python and processing. So if that is something that interests you, uh, I'd be happy to speak further. So I, I would like to end on one last quote. And this is taken from an article that I read in the Atlantic uh, magazine. And the title of it is, Scientists are totally rethinking cognition. Quote, no aspect of our world is as mysterious as consciousness. The state of awareness that animates our every waking moment the sense of being located in a body that exists within a larger world of color, sound, and touch, all of it filtered through our thoughts and imbued by emotion. Even in a secular age, consciousness retains a mystical sheen. It is alternatively described as the last frontier of science and as a kind of immaterial 
magic behind, beyond science's reckoning. David Chalmers, one of the world's most respected philosophers on the subject, once said that consciousness could be a fundamental feature of the universe, like space-time or energy. He said it might be tied to the diaphanous indeterminate workings of the quantum world or something non-physical, unquote. So for me, that brings me back to reality may not be what it seems. Thanks so much. I turn it over to you, Lexi. Thank you, Eva. I would, I would clap, but I don't wanna shock anybody's ears coming through the screen, but that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we are able to open the floor for questions. If you are joining us virtually, please feel free to type your questions into the chat. If you are in person, I believe we will be passing around a microphone. Um, so just raise your hand and they will find you. And Eva, I'll translate anything that can't be heard. Sounds I, good. Eva Irene Kim says, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. And while we're getting our questions going, I have a question. Um, are you able to share anything specific that you are doing to incorporate this uh, fourth industrial revolution into your work? Do you have any ideas percolating? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I do, actually. I, I have been spending the last um, uh, two to three years, um, and I did develop a project which I was applying for grants. Uh, and it would have been to collaborate with AI researchers at the University of Tokyo. Um, so it is still in the works, but of course, because of COVID-19, um, many things are on hold. Uh, so that is on hold right now because of uh, travel restrictions um, and also because I am still working on funding. Um, you know, uh, given that we all have had to be, you know, working by the, the going with the flow in the seat of our pants, you know, in many different ways, I'm actually now thinking if I, I if there's anyone who's interested in uh, learning more about this, um, I would be happy to do this uh, in the US. Um, the only reason why I was interested in doing it at the University of Tokyo was because um, there is a DLX laboratory there uh, where they specifically put artists together with um, researchers at the university. And um, so there was a certain kind of momentum, but, and also, you know, the, uh, in Japan, they're quite known for their robotics. Um, uh, but it doesn't have to be there. Uh, I would be open to doing it here. So thanks for asking. And we've got another question in the, in the chat. This is from Heidi Hamill. She said, hi, Eva, lovely presentation. I wonder what you think about how the pandemic has effectively forced so many of us far deeper into the virtual world. I am attending virtually. I now explore the universe virtually. What are your thoughts about the pandemic's effect? Wow. Um, yeah, I think that that really has shifted so many of us. Um, I, I actually, you know, when I haven't seen friends in a while and then we get connected again, whether virtually, you know, or on the phone or what have you, um, you know, one of the first thing I say is like, how are you doing in these Gaga times, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I think that it's, I think that no matter what, it has been a challenging time for everyone in different ways. And I do think that, um, we have shifted in how we work, how, you know, the children and, and college students, high school students are all going to school. So education is shifting, um, you know, you name it. There isn't a single uh, field out there that hasn't been changed by the pandemic. And I have a feeling that, you know, when we go back to normal, um, it's going to be a different normal. I guess that's basically my thoughts. Um, and, and, you know, by the way, this q and I'm happy if anybody else wants to chime in and, and you know, uh, voice their thoughts uh, on this. Um, but I guess that would be the answer to, my, to that question. 
I think the the very existence of this hybrid event tonight with you shows that the world is forever changed by the pandemic and we are using technology in new ways. But look how wonderful some of those new things are. Beth, do we have any questions from the in-person audience? Let's see. Does anyone want the microphone to ask questions? Oh, we've got one. Oh, you have a comment. Is this okay? What's the comment? Do you want the mic? And Eva, we're going to translate these in case you aren't able to hear the question. Yeah. I'm a computer programmer, and I have to say that I was absolutely blown away by how you took data and made it into art. That is, I'm speechless, and thank you very much. Eva, she said, uh, did you understand? Yeah, I actually heard that. Oh, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that enthusiasm. Um, I really have Art -a Hack to thank for that. Um, the idea was mine, but it w was a collaboration. Uh, it would not have been realized without the programmers, without um, you know the designer who designed the headgear. Um, we all did together uh, come up with what the visuals uh, could look like, what they should look like, um, and we decided we wanted to keep it looking like waves, um, brain waves, um, but then to also add kind of, uh, you know, an audience connection to it through um, colors and, and um, moving, uh, and, and also to project it, you know, in, in a, a, a large scale. Um, so, but thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, you know, and, and if I didn't mention it in the talk, I mean, one of the wonderful things about Artahack is that, you know, the, I came up with the idea because they actually said in their call for um, proposals that they had open BCI uh, gear there. And I actually had not known about that before. And when I looked further into it, I thought, my goodness, you know, I mean, putting it together with Dr. Richard Davidson's work and uh, Dr. Cohen's work, um, it was like bingo. You know, I, I mean, it must have been a bit like how Alice Simon must have felt when, you know, someone offered her the use of an atomic, you know, particle accelerator. I mean, it's kind of like, wow, yeah, I'll take that and I'll try it, please. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything? Okay, Lexi, I think we're all good in here. If you have um, any closing comments. I, th I think one more question. We've got one from Kent who says, fascinating presentation. I've been reading about how animals perceive the world much differently than we do because they rely on different senses. Would there be any way to use this technology to explore how their consciousness is so different? Wow, I would like to pose that question to the computer scientist out in the audience. Can we do that? <laughs> Let's see if we get a response from that uh, spot. I love that idea. I mean, essentially, it's how, yes, how different consciousness is. How do we translate that? Um, <laughs> she said, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sounds like something that we could all probably investigate further and see what's being done, you know, on the, on the frontier, uh, on the front lines of that. Um, I, I, you know, maybe this is kind of related, but I, I have been, um, I have been concerned about ethics, you know, in, in all these new uh, tools of our time. And there, there are a couple, actually not just a couple, there are many. Um, there are many ethics organizations such as the Future of Life Institute, uh, that is a U.S.-based one that's founded by physicist Max Tegmark and the Skype founder. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Yab Talin. Um, Elon Musk is involved in it. Uh, Nick Bostrom, the physicist, uh, sorry, the philosopher is involved in it. 
um, as well as the IBM scientist, Francesca Rossi, um, and, and many, many others. So, so there is that. And in the UK, there is the Future of Humanity Institute, um, and that's founded by the philosopher Nick Bostrom once again. Um, so there are people who are working in those fields um, and who are concerned, and they are getting together and having conferences um, to discuss these things. And you know, I think we can all get on mailing lists and, and listen in on these conferences and perhaps become part of it and ask questions and learn about like how exactly can we, how do coders and how do um, computer scientists write the instructions that self-learning AI learn from? And, and you know, how is this big data fed and that they have to learn from big data. Self-learning machines have to learn from big data. And what is that data? You know, the, the data that you feed it actually affects very much um, the outcomes and, and the way that uh, self-learning machines learn. And I think we can all get more educated about how that works. Um, but I think that, you know, th that particular question, how animals learn and, and yes, and how people perceive too and how we learn. I mean, there are all kinds of things that we, we know and we feel when we're in each other's presences. And we maybe call it intuition, but you know, perhaps that is something that just hasn't been quant quantified. I don't know. Um, but there are so many ways that people communicate with each other. And what is that? We can't even exactly say. So how do you take that and then encode it? It's, it's really going to take a lot of I think for us as humans now to dive within ourselves. And I think that meditation, the, the, some of the strengths that can come um, and the ethical strengths also that can come from uh, Buddhist meditation uh, practices have a lot to show the way. So. Thank you, Eva. All right. Well, I think that's all of the questions and I will just say thank you one more time. This has been wonderful. Thank you for helping us create uh, our first hybrid program where the audience was in person and the artist was virtual. This has opened up new paths for us and we just really appreciate you. Oh, thanks so much. I, I should be thanking you guys. I just think it's wonderful to, you know, be able to speak and, and get thought going, you know, Let, let's all get momentum going and uh, get out there while we're heading into this new frontier together. <laughs> all right. And um, anybody who is in person, if you would like, I'm about to do a brief tour in the gallery of Experimental Light, uh, Alice Simon and Eva Lee. So I will see y'all in person again in just a minute. And thank it. Thank you all for joining us virtually. Thank you, Eva and enjoy your evening. Thanks, enjoy it in person. <laughs> Thank you so much, yay. Okay.